see the first topic here is four lectures on finite dimensional linear and geometry. I gave the first two lectures last time. In notation, uh, we always consider the operator on finite dimensional vector spaces. And the letter H is devoted to people who enjoy physics because these will be Hamiltonians. And there will be many symmetry groups involved, but in this case, the full symmetry group of linear symmetries And of course, that means that the element here is an isomorphism, so an invertible linear transformation. And many things don't, of an operator, do not depend on the operator. Many things just depend on the operator modulo symmetry. So, so the action of this group always have a background action of some symmetry group. What happens is you conjugate the operator by the symmetry. As I said, many things about the operator really don't depend on the operator. They depend on the operator modulo of this action. So our little goal from last time, I'm just reviewing now is to under, understand invariance of this. Of this action. So what are the laws that are applied to such operators are invariant under conjugation. So an invariant is then just a function, in this case everything is complex value. <clears throat> and the invariance property is that if you apply the symmetry to the operator and then the invariant, you get the same thing. Last time I spent uh, a bit of time motivating the so-called trace function on the Hamiltonian. So recall the last time we defined the trace function, function. This is essentially the only linear invariant up to a constant. Factor, the only linear invariant. <clears throat> and I normalized it. Now, there are many normalizations, but my favorite definition is on rank one operators. We define a trace of the operator f tensor v as just f of v. <laughs> About the most stupid definition you could think of. Recall this operator here is the operator, it's a rank one operator, which when you apply it to a vector w, you just 
apply the functional. So f is a functional, v is a, some, somebody asked about functionals, so I use the word functional dedicated to you. So f is a linear function, v is a, a vector, of course, and the notation here is tensor notation, which I'll explain sometime, but right now it's just this operator. We apply this to something w, means you apply the function to the uh, w and then fix this. So this is the trace on rank one uh, operators, and then you extend extend in the obvious way by linearity to the full endomorphism algebra. So we have this trace function, which is incredibly important in uh, all forms of mathematics I know about. So this is the first, first uh, Invariant, I write one because it's a linear invariant, is just the trace of H. And then there are many other invariants. HK, I use the notation of H, is just the trace of H to the K. So these are all invariants of conjugation. So you see infinitely many. Uh, invariants of, on the blackboard, and if you're a person who likes to compute, you're not very happy because <laughs> you don't want to have to compute infinitely many things, right? So we ask the question. So questions: Is this all? In other words, are there other invariants in some sense? And the other question is, do we have to use all of these? For all k. And then I answer the question in a certain way, yes, this is all. And the second question is, do we have to use all of these? And, and, and the answer is no. That's good. That's good news. We only need finitely many of these. Okay. So this led us last time to uh, study the, the possibility of computation of these invariants. And we made the observation <clears throat> if H is diagonalizable, diagonalizable, then, uh, so H uh, in some frame has the matrix, well, let's write it here, i.e. in some frame, the matrix of H is a diagonal matrix. Then we are very lucky we can compute. Very simple minded thing. Then uh, this kth invariant of H is the same as the kth invariant of the diagonal. In this diagonal matrix in this frame. And it's the kth Newton polynomial. This is just a word, kth Newton polynomial, which is just some of the po kth powers of the diagonal terms. The Newton polynomials appear, therefore, in a very natural way in this context. Let me comment on the notion of diagonalizability before going further.
big word. I just wrote it in German recently. When I first learned German, I used to uh, have the challenge of writing the longest words. You know, German, many long words. This is called Diagonale Zierbarkeit. <laughs> I used to like very many words in mathematics in German. For example, uh, probability uh, uh, distribution. Wahrscheinlichkeitsverteilung. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, I mean, you can make arbitrarily nice long words, but it's, <laughs> even in English, this is a long word. <laughs> right? So, this means uh, I'm talking about the diagonalizability of, of an operator H, and here I discussed it in terms of some frame where you can write the matrix. That's what you learn in, in eighth grade, if you're a German, in eighth grade, the diagonal matrix. Yeah. But you should think a little bit better than that. It means there is an H invariant decomposition V, V1 direct sum Vn. So you decompose the vector space into lines. So these are one-dimensional subspaces. And every vector can be uniquely decomposed into a sum of these vectors in these one-dimensional subspaces. We call in physics a one-dimensional subspace has the interpretation of as a, it's called a state, a state of a system. So this is very good, a good operator. Uh, this operator leaves invariant separate states. Now note that if, say, V is in one of these things, VI, then H of VI is again in this thing, H of V, I'm sorry, in VJ, then H is again in it, and that means that it's just a multiple of it. H of V is just a multiple of V. Now you've seen these things before. These lambdas are called, as you know, called eigenvectors. Eigenvalues and the vectors are called eigenvectors. Right. And this is just words. Many of my students uh, in, throughout my long life, if I ask them what is the geometric interpretation of an eigenvector, or the geometric interpretation of a stable invariant state. Many of my students cannot answer that question. I'm sure you can, but just let me remind you what it means. It means that the complex line through this vector v, you could hold this vector for me, this complex line through his vector is invariant. A complex line is all complex multiples of that. If we would do it in our Euclidean world, that would be two-dimensional because it's a complex plane. This means that this has the possibility of rotating around here also. You see it? It could rotate or it could dilate, but it's just a complex multiple. Over the reals, this is a real multiple. It's very important here to maybe just to emphasize that, that, that it looks like this, right? It's a, it's a complex number, so it's a dilation by lambda and a rotation by phi in this state. Okay, so that's the geometric meaning. Yes. Okay, so that's diagonalizability. It doesn't mean here that these eigenvalues or these lambdas are all different. I didn't claim that as a statement. They could be all the same, right? In each direction, just uh, this could be the identity. <laughs> Every direction, do nothing. That still is a decomposition in, in, uh, in, uh, in different things. So maybe there will be multiplicities here. Maybe an eigenvalue will appear many times. <clears throat> OK, that's what diagonalizability means. But you see, in the frame, V, 
V1 through Vn. So I'm now taking, maybe here I should have been really, and maybe I should be precise. I don't want to take zero. Yeah, in this frame, the matrix of H is the value of matrix. That's what the statement over there means. In this frame, it's a diagonal matrix. In some other frame, it may be ridiculous. Do you understand this? You may have a diagonalizable matrix. If you give me a random, a random matrix, uh, for example, I don't know. Here, here's, here's, ah! I want to give you a non-random matrix. <laughs> you see this matrix? This is not random. This is not random. This even has a name in electrical engineering and physics even. In, uh, I called it J. This matrix. <laughs> yeah. I call this matrix J. And through, can you compute what that is? Can you do it in your head? Yeah, it's minus the identity. Minus the identity. This is a little bit of review and a little bit of fun. Do you remember? that there is a theorem called the theorem of Cayley Hamilton, which says the characteristic, I'm, I'm jumping ahead now, but you remember this theorem, right? The characteristic, the, 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 the matrix or the operator satisfies the characteristic polynomial, or the minimal polynomial, but this is degree two, so it's the minimal polynomial. This says the characteristic or minimal polynomial in this case is x squared plus one, right? I've written the equation down there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so you know that the, the, yes, that means the characteristic polynomial is x squared plus 1. This means without computation, the eigenvalues of this, poly, of this operator are plus minus i. We are dealing with all vector spaces over the complex numbers. This operator is invertible over A is diagonalizable over the complex numbers. Okay. But many people would tell you it's not diagonalizable because they're working over the real numbers. We almost never work over the real numbers. You see the problem is the polynomial x squared plus 1 equals 0 only has complex. Okay. So this is okay. So the matrix of this in the correct basis whatever i is you should think about it for a long time and realize that i is not well defined you write plus i and minus y tell give me a break what, what is the difference between i don't know how are we going to decide what is plus and minus you should think about it a little bit it's not so clear there's no such thing I have engineering students. Where is plus i? <laughs> well, plus i is there. <laughs> Minus i is there. I don't know. <laughs> right. My favorite question is, where is the square root of i? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit smaller. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine. So in this frame, you have the diagonalizable. Okay. So we know what these invariants are on the diagonalizable uh, operators. We, we discussed this last time on the diagonalizable operators. So on the diagonalizable operators, so this D, which is the diagonalizable operator. On this thing, on these diagonalizable operators, I k is of H is known. It's known. You diagonalize and it's the Newton polynomial. Okay. Now, the first question here is how many diagonalizable operators are there? 
Right? It's a reasonable question. I mean, if I'm, I'm making a big propaganda for the diagonalizable operators, right? They're great. <laughs> How many diagonalizable operators are there? Are there many, or a few, or 27, or 100, or whatever? So well, let's write that as a question. How big is the set D? That's a stupid statement. Because I write down a diagonal matrix and I have uncountably many choices for the diagonal. Okay, but it's a good first stupid statement, so I like it. You have to put, I always say begin with the minus one remark. That's even minus five. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, with respect to the set of all operators, how big is it? So you should, because we really, I mean, we were talking about the space of all operators. And if we're lucky, D is a very big subset. If we're lucky. Now, how are we going to measure how big a subset is? What are you, a physicist? Huh? Yeah. Well, good. So you do measurements all the time, right? I mean, we talked about that. You measure with something, right? Okay, so we need some way of measuring here how big the set is. For example, volume or something. I don't know. Something like this. Probability. Hmm? Probability. So maybe we need a probability. Yes, that's a very nice remark. This is just minus one, not minus five. So you might say, no, 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 it's a very beautiful remark. If I throw a piece of chalk at, the de at this subset, will I hit it with probability one? That would be a very nice, wouldn't that be nice? So if I take a random choice of a, a matrix, will it be diagonalized? Well, the subset is very big. Let's measure it. Let's try to measure it now. And so let me make an attempt at measuring this, understanding this. And the first attempt is something that I think you all have seen in, in mathematics. You, you took some mathematics in some time, right? Well, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, I did mathematics. Yeah. And you learn, the point is, uh, you learn a so-called so, so Gauss... Uh, it has a name for Gauss did many things. This is, what is it called? The row reduction or something. Elimination. Elimination. Huh? Elimination. Gaussian elimination. You take the first column and you mess around with it and, and kill everything and, and put, put something up in there, right? And then you take the second column and you mess around, yeah? So you're accustomed maybe, you know what I mean by that, yeah. You're accustomed maybe to putting things in triangular form, yeah? So I think maybe uh, triangular form Not, not, not maybe diagonal form, it might be possible. And I assigned you that as one of the homework exercises, actually. I don't know if you look. Let me give a big hint on the homework exercises. If, if you haven't done them yet, you might. Let me tell you how I think about it. So the abstract notion is abstract statement is H in an arbitrary operator stabilizes a full flag. Diagonalizability means 
it stabilizes a direct sum decomposition of one-dimensional subspaces. Right? That's a very strong statement. It cannot be reached in general, but what can be reached in general is the stabilization of a full flag. What is a full flag? Full flag is zero-dimensional subspace, one-dimensional subspace, two-dimensional subspace, etc., n minus one-dimensional subspace, d. Uh, people have told me if you think about this geometrically, it looks like a flag, but I, 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 I don't see this picture of a flag right now. It's just a sequence of subspaces. One dimension, you see it, a one-dimensional, think over the real, a real line in a plane, in a three-space, in a four-space, and so on. An expanding sequence, one at a time, okay? And that's the reason the word full is used, because it only jumps one at a time, one jump at a time in dimension, okay? It's called a full flag. So the I dimension. think flag is because you have like the point, then you have the line of the flag, and then you have the flag. <laughs> really? You understand this picture? Yes. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to draw a picture. What is it? Well, it's exactly a flag, like how a, a national flag. <laughs> So you start with the point, so one Where? dimensional, you? yes, you have the line. Yes. And then you have your flag. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, come on. I understand it goes point, one dimension and two dimensions. Yes. I mean if you would have said this. I mean if you would have said this, I would have bought bought it. A point, a line. In the plane. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but then is the, the uh, two-dimensional in 3D, because you think in 3D. You know? I, I, I think I know what I mean. I mean, if you put like a line here, no? and then a shorter line, and then a shorter line, and then shorter, you get a flag. No, but you have this in 3D. In real life, it's in 3D, and then it's 2D. Everybody's getting excited about this. Right? <laughs> it's a flag without stick, maybe. What? A flag no. without stick? <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Guys. Okay. Like some triangle flag. Okay, yeah. oh, yeah, look, just define it as an abstract flag, and that's what it is. I mean, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, the dimension of this thing, the dimension of VD is D. Okay, now I'm going to tell you how to prove this. I'm not going to write it on the board because it's a homework exercise. Okay, the first step is to find a one dimensional invariant subspace. I usually do this by just simply writing down the equation for a sub, for a sub yeah, an equation. The equation is h of v equals lambda v. That's an equation. Okay? And solve it. Okay? You can always do that over the complex numbers. Not over, yeah, not over the reals, you know that. A rotation over the reals does not in, our two, in the two-dimensional space. A rotation does not have a one-dimensional invariant subspace. Okay. Over the complex numbers, you write the equation, you get one. But maybe you only get one. Okay. Now, you have to become sophisticated. Are you sophisticated? I, you look at me. <laughs> okay. Get one. And then, go to V modulo that. <clears throat> That's a good jump in sophistication, right? Or, or not. I mean, that. No, seriously, I'll see it. Do you know what I mean by V modulo that? Okay. Now, then let's talk. This is fundamental. Okay? I'm looking at the vector space modulo a one-dimensional subspace. Here you see this. What? This thing in the quotient. I think is the most important operation in mathematics. I think. Quotient. It's a very fundamental operation. I think it's worth worth wait. It's not wasting time. Let's let's discuss it a little bit here. Okay. Let's discuss it a little bit. This I think also for applied science it's fundamental. I mean, it's not just some mathematical nonsense. Okay. It means we have an equivalence relation. We define two vectors to be equivalent if their difference is in this space. Now, are you up to par on equivalence relations? What, 
Now, you know what I mean when I say equivalence. That's, that's okay. Right? We, okay. Now, let's, let, let's really look at this. This is the main reason to give lectures, is to find out where we all are. I'm going to draw a picture of this. So I'm going to draw a picture of this. Here is the vector space V I'm inside that box. The vector space V has, it, this is a vector space, it has zero, right? right? So let's put in zero. Okay. This is a one dimensional subspace. So that's a line through zero, a complex line, okay? I'm going to watch you because you, you haven't seen this kind of stuff before. You're going to learn now, for sure. I guarantee it. Here, always draw a line like it's not just, I mean, a little bit off. Okay? So this will be V1. Okay. When you're doing mathematics, don't have any fear at all. Just start doing stupid things. That's the reason I told you it was stupid. Because it's good. Right? No, it's good to be, really. So let's see what is equivalent to zero. Where's the definition? On here. In other words, what's equivalent to if I put here uh, zero? <laughs> Yeah, it just has to be in, in V1. Okay, you know, you know the equivalence class is called, it's called the equivalence class, it has a, has a, a, a something like this. Right? That's, well, aha, what's equivalent to a point W here? Well, look, 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 what's happening, what's equivalent to W? V is equivalent to W, means V minus W is in V1, means V is in W plus V1. Right? V minus W is V1 means V is in W plus everything you can get by V1. Okay, well, isn't that beautiful? That's W. Okay, give me another letter. Zeta. What's equivalent to zeta? Everything in zeta plus V1. You understand what group action is going on here? Your action by translation by V1. Two things are equivalent if you can translate one into the other by something in V1. Okay? You just understood it. So, what you get here is the space of equivalence classes is just Let's say, just, just to dramatize the situation here, here's, here's the equivalence class of zero. And maybe the uh, equivalence class of something else. W, I don't know. This equivalence class of W is a very important discussion. This is equivalence class of W. It's down here. Have you got it? You got it now. What it means? I mean, uh, suddenly this is not. This whole thing is one point, really, because we're, right. Okay, no problem. I knew you'd understand. Okay. Okay. Now. Okay. This thing down here, you can check it. This is what we call it V modulo V1. I mean, the word modulo is okay. I mean, it's modulo, it's, we're forgetting all of this stuff and just make, make it as V modulo V1. It's a good one. Okay. This is also a vector space. In a stupid way. Namely, I add uh, V uh, plus V1. That's an element down here. Plus W plus V1. I add two things here. Oh, maybe to make it good, I'll put zeta here that I've already got up here. I've got zeta up here and translated all over the place. I've got w here translated all over the place. 
And it's just you just make the obvious definition. So you just have this vector space structure downstairs. As he said, I'm sorry, I, don't know your, I forgot your name, but Mihai. Hmm? Mihai. Mihai. What Mihai is saying here is this is the most, one of the most fundamental constructions in mathematics. Is going to we call this a quotient space. In this case, you're just, it's a silly thing. You're looking at the affine action. You're looking at translations by v1. Bunch of lines here. You're saying, okay, I'm just, I'm just making them each as a point. And I get a vector space again. This is the good thing. I start with a vector space. I end up with a vector space. Okay. okay. So you want us to think about one-dimensional space as one point. That's right. So okay. as one point, exactly. I didn't say it. You repeated what I wanted to say, but that's exactly right. This one-dimensional things are not just a point. Okay. I mean, you can consider them one-dimensional things, but it gets confusing, <laughs> right? Okay. Now, here's the fact that you need to check. But it's a very easy one to check. You can just check it yourself, okay? If H, this operator, stabilizes the thing that you started with, Okay? So this operator is doing things in here. It stabilizes this thing here. Then, let's say H1 can be pushed down to the quotient space, is well defined by H1 of equivalence class of the equals the equivalence class of H of V. <laughs> now, that's horrible. <laughs> and you hate me for writing that. So, watch this. So what happens. If I take V here, okay? V there. And I look at H of V. Well, let's see where H, H, I don't know what H does. Oh, this, this is going to be really, this is going to be, yeah, this is going to be, what is this going to be? <laughs> let's just see what this means. H1 of V, all this, here's all of this translation, right? This whole set, that's what, uh, Latif is talking about here. Let's look at what he's talking about. This is a whole line. And now, the word I'm saying is, I can just define it as it. Okay. So, let's say here, H of V, let's say H of V is here. And, uh, oh, oh, my color coding is, let's see if I can get a decent color coding. H of V is there. So this is H of V. Okay. And let me see. Here's V. And V goes to H of V. Okay. So suppose I take here another thing here, like V hat. Can anybody tell me where it has to go? In the picture? It has to go in the same place, right? So V goes to here, H of V hat goes here. But that's just the linearity that's going on down here, right? You see? So in some sense, it's what it's what Latif wanted to say here. You take this line and let H act on this line and it goes over to this line. But this line's a point. So H acts on this point, goes to that point. Is it clear? If I take anything here, it has to go over here like this. Just by linearity. So I just regard it as a point and it goes over here. Okay? That's the great thing. Fact. If H stabilizes the thing that you've divided out by, modded out by, then you can push it down to the quotient. It's just this picture. Okay? 
Now, let's go back in my head. One dimensional invariant subspace, mod out by it, apply induction. The theorem is proved. Induction on dimension. Right? Stabilize one dimensional subspace, apply induction on dimension. The theorem is almost proved. Downstairs is now trying to deform. Right? But trying to deform downstairs means trying to deform upstairs. Do you see why? I go downstairs to V2. To, I'm looking for downstairs, I'm looking for V2, right? Can we go through this together? You see it? You're looking downstairs for V2. No, 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 no. Downstairs, V2 is only one dimensional. I'm only looking one dimensional downstairs, right? Well, I have a one dimensional invariant subspace, right? Okay, it's invariant downstairs. But what does it mean it's invariant downstairs? It means when you push it up upstairs, it, you get a two dimensional invariant subspace, right? So if you have something downstairs invariant, so V1 half downstairs, Invariant. Let's call this mapping pi. Means that you pull it back, you get a two dimensional subspace which is upstairs invariant. Okay, you see this. V1, the V1 goes to lambda times V1 because it's one dimensional stable. V2, no, it does not. Only V1, V2 is stable. So that means V1, V2 goes to some multiple of V2 plus something times V1. Right? V3 is not really in I mean, V3 is not an eigenvector. V3 goes to itself plus something in, in this three dimensional space. You don't know. Okay? So you have a triangular form. Okay, any questions about, I mean, this was a, a little diversion, but I think it's worthwhile for, and it's really worthwhile to think conceptually about this. I mean, you see, I, I have this conceptually in my head and I don't need to compute at all, right? Okay, so, so we're pretty optimistic. We found at least a triangular form. Maybe we can find even a diagonal form that's in invariant. So let's try the stupidest. triangular form we can think of and see if it, maybe we can put it in diagonal form. Let's take, say, some frame.
And let's define h of v0 equals v0. <laughs> well, we're on our way to a diagonal form, right? But let's do what we did with this flag. h of v1 equals v1. But remember, the flag, the flag says it goes to v1, and then maybe something plus something in v0, right? So let's put some t here. And I recommend to you, in all of mathematics, to follow your nose by putting parameters in things, OK? So I, I recommend the following thing. Start with something trivial, namely t equals 0, and move it. Do you understand? I, just, I took t as a little parameter. If you want, I'll put epsilon there to convince you it's a little. Okay. So start with something trivial and push it a bit. OK, let's see what happens. Well, let's see what happens. Well, let's pretend this is an orthogonal basis. Let's see, here's V0. Here is uh, V1. Okay? I now use arrows so that you could be really happy. Okay. What happens to V0? Where is it? Up there. It's fixed, right? So maybe I'll put little X's here to indicate that this thing is fixed. Oh, that's great. That means that this one-dimensional subspace, well, we know that. I mean, it's stupid. This one-dimensional subspace is fixed. <laughs> OK. Now let's, let's see what happens to V1. Uh -huh. V1 goes to V1 plus T. Let's say T is bit, let's say T is just a little, uh, out here twice or two. So here is H of V1. Uh huh. That's H of V1. What about if I take something in here? This is V0 plus. Uh, what is this? this uh, this is, I don't know what this is. This is, uh, oh, right here. V0 plus epsilon H, uh, V1. Where does it go? Huh? It goes out here, right? It gets, what happens? Yeah, it, it gets, here's V0, it goes out here. H, V0 equals V1. Okay. You see what happens here? We call these mapping shears. Do you see what it, why it's a shear? As you move away from the fixed point, this thing's shearing out like this, is it? Yeah? OK? Have I, have I done this the right way? You agree with me on this? H of V1 is there. We start with V0 plus a little bit of V1. It goes out here to V0. It's, well, what does it do? Let's just write it. It goes to V0 plus epsilon plus T V1. It goes out here. Do you see any possibility for another invariant subspace? Huh? It sounds right, but it's a what? It's epsilon, it's one plus epsilon two V zero plus epsilon V one. That's the right answer. I'm not I'm, I'm acoustically I'm not. the right answer is one plus epsilon T V zero plus epsilon V one. What is the right answer to what? Pure computation. This should be what? 1 plus epsilon tv0 plus epsilon v1. Oh, yeah. 1 plus epsilon v0. Epsilon tv0. Epsilon tv0. Yeah, very good. You can do a calculation. Plus what? v1? Plus epsilon v1. Plus epsilon v1. Okay, so what's, what's, what's happening, uh, epsilon v1, oh, it's very good, the height stays the same. That's the main point, right? The height stays the same, but this, this, this translation is increasing here all the time, okay? So you can see it's, it's shearing off this way. So this operator is not diagonalizable.
you see what the matrix of this operator is in this basin. I just explained it to you. If you take a line here and apply it to any vector in the line, it's going to shear it off like that. Right? You see? So this time, all I suppose it's just that. Okay, yeah, it's rotated. It, it, it rotates it. No, 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 it's just shearing. Shearing. I don't know. Oh, in some sense, I see what you're saying, but. I don't know the word shearing. Do uh, you know about wind shear? This, this kind of thing? It's called a shear. It doesn't matter. You see, if you take a line, what's going to happen to it is never going to be indirect. It's going to, unless it's just this line. Right? Now you can check the fact. The fact is, if H, if the matrix of H in some frame is of the form here, with something above, you understand what I mean by that putting that star there? With something serious above, I mean not zero. <laughs> if I put zero there, it's diagonal. If you put anything above, it is never diagonalized. And it's going to be the same reason. Okay. So this is not. And not that one. Okay. So this was a homework exercise, by the way. So, in my picture, well, my picture is gone now, but there are certainly non-diagonalizable matrices, but I claim that's basically the phenomenon that happens when something is not diagonalized. And now, a fact, and that was a homework exercise, If the tri a triangular form, say as a matrix, this is the form here. So one stabilizes the flag, one takes the basis, and one has the triangular form, and lambda i's are different from each other. Then h is diagonal. Exercise if I tell you what matrices or operators to try by operators of the form and I call them U for reasons of mathematical notation these operators are called unipotent operators and the reason they're called unipotent is because of the ones along the diagonal. And you can check with an induction argument very easily, just, just conjugate, to start using these little, little, little uh, operators here to start conjugating to kill the off-diagonal terms here. Just try it. Sit down and try it with three by three and then you know what to do. Okay. Okay, so you can always diagonalize them if these lambdas are different. That's very interesting. Okay. Now all of that is completely standard. But the following picture 
maybe you haven't seen is here is the band set non diagonalizable operator. And here is an operator H, which is not diagonalizable. I just showed you one. Okay. Tell me how to move it to make it diagonalizable. You don't need a tsunami. You just translation. A translation. Yeah. Somehow. You, uh, what do you mean by translation? You said by translation. I mean that picture. <laughs> you hope you have to know that I wish most of the pictures would be a square in the line. <laughs> okay. No, no, let's think together. You have an operator that's not diagonalizable. What does that mean? That means you can conjugate it to triangular form because it fixes a flag. And now, how are you going to introduce a small earthquake? You just make the diagonal. Terms will be different and you like finished. Small earthquake, you, you gave the proof. <laughs> Bring it, find a frame where the thing is in triangular form. God only knows what the diagonal is. Introduce a small earthquake so that all the diagonal terms are different. Right? That operator is diagonalized. So I hope you see that nearby, let's put the operator H epsilon for earthquake, small earthquake nearby is a diagonalizable operator. Okay? You give me any small number in physics, not a number. <laughs> I can bring, I can make the with a, a earthquake of that size. I can make all the diagonal terms different, can't I? I mean, this is just, right? Yeah? So, for every operator, there is an operator arbitrarily nearby. That means you give me the distance and I can find an operator in your distance. You get, you get what I'm saying? No. Yeah? Yeah. He gave me, he gave me a nano ball here. Nano ball. Very small. Arbitrarily small. You give me whatever, you, and I can put a, a small earthquake and get a diagonalizable operator there. Right? Everybody understands? That says the set of diagonalizable matrices or operators are dense. Call this set B. It's dense. A half an hour ago, I'm sorry I dwelled on the subject so long, but it now answers the question very well. They're almost all operators are diagonalizable. Uh, professor, since you are defining a ball, do you first need to define the metric? Of the very good. So this is the next question. What in the devil do I mean by I need a distance? No, so I mean Q is dense in R. But Q is very small compared to the rest of the okay. things. Okay, now we're getting some very these are these are mathematicians talking here about very fancy stuff. Okay. Uh, yesterday or no Friday, I talked about saying well the n by times n matrices is the same thing as c to the n, and if you take a frame c to the n squared. And if you take a frame, you're really talking about matrices, and this is talking about c to the n, because you have n squared coefficients in the matrix, right? And that's just a usual vector space. So I mean by that some standard distance function on a vector space. Okay? You asked me about who asked about the metric, or you, yeah. So I mean we take this some standard distance, we should take a standard norm here. So the distance between z and w is norm z minus w, norm w squared. Okay. And you can check that this distance function, the, the, the 
it doesn't matter what identification you made here, you get the same, in mathematical terms, the same topology. So an equivalent metric. That's Any two norms are equivalent. Yeah, that doesn't work as a metric. I did, huh? Mm. So by the way, never use the norm function. It is not differentiable. It is not differentiable in zero. You understand that? The problems with the norm function, because it's got a square root in it. It's the square root, you understand? It's the square root of x squared plus y squared. This is a very bad function, so I never use it. Okay? Well, the sum of the squares is not a metric. I don't care. <laughs> it's a distance function for me. It defines the topology. Okay. Don't be formal. Mm -hmm. It is not a metric. But if you write the sum of the squares with a square root, it is not differentiable. And if you do that and take the derivative at zero, you get one over something, which blows up. So this is a bad function, whereas the sum of the squares is a good function. Okay. So I don't know anybody in the world who would define a circle in any other way than this. Right? <laughs> Or if you want a radius, and do it that way. But don't take the square root. Okay. Good. Now where are we? Uh, oh, this answered your question. We just take any any distance function like that. Now what was your question? I said that Q is also less than R, but Q is okay. much smaller than R, and the things that are like near Q are much smaller. Okay, bigger. so, so uh, let's talk about this in a language that everybody in this room can understand. Okay. You know, so I'm, I'm sorry I pick on you guys, but, but I know you're not, you're in physics also? Yeah. Yeah. So when he says Q, he means the rational numbers. You know what I mean by rational numbers. And he just said Q is dense in the real numbers. This is a correct uh, fact, because every real number has a decimal expansion, and you can certainly, and rational numbers are periodic decimals. You give me an arbitrary decimal expansion, I go out as far as you want me to go out, and then I put in periodicity after that, and I've got me a rational number that's very near your real number. That's his statement that the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. Second point, he said, I'm just repeating what he said, there are not many rational numbers. If you try to count them, it's easy to see that every rational number is n over n, right? Or maybe you think of it as a pair, let's make a mistake, it's a pair, n and m. And now you do the lexicography of all order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you count them on your hand. We say such a set is countable. It's a very, very small set because the real numbers are not counted. It's easy to see. Okay, so he's right about that. Now, we take his construction, and he says, make a small earthquake. Remember where we are now. Take a diagonalizable thing, make a small, uh, a triangleizable thing, make a small earthquake so that all the lambda i's are different. Right? Okay? Right. Now, Let's think together. Take something where all the lambda i's are different and make a small earthquake. What happened? It stay in. in. If you take a, a, a <laughs> rational number and make a small earthquake, you're going to get big time everything nearby, right? Okay. So the set of Triangle, the set of operators whose triangle, triangular forms have your form is not only dense, it is invariant under small earthquakes, right? It is open. It says that you have one of these things, then you have a nano, maybe not a very big nano ball, but you have a nano ball around it that's still in there. So this is an open dense set. So it's a very, very big, not only dense, but open and dense set. Okay? So I didn't want to get into this mathematical terminology, but you get, you get the idea. This is a huge set. If you're in it, at least with his kind of thing, 
I mean, where all these things are different, then, then you stay in it when you're with a small movement. That's, that's, that's a key way of thinking, okay? It's a key way if you have, you know, in, in, in applied sciences, you, you are interested in notion of stability. This means you have an idealized law in applied science. Right? You want to know human beings' laws are wrong. It's a theory. It's only an approximative theory. You want to know if you move the parameters a little bit, if the theory stays the same or more or less the same. And the answer is here, yes. Okay, that's, that's a good... That's a good okay. okay, so I think that explains that. So it's... Uh, uh, and let me put here also... Uh, if lambda i... nearby operators and diagonalizing. So that was the okay. Now we're gonna really have some fun. You're also in physics. Great. We're going to have some really good fun. Some frame is diagonal. This means that every H is diagonalizable in, in every. This means that. I of G of H for any I is I of G of H, yes, at any H is equal to I of H is equal to some polynomial in the Newton polynomial. Remember, let's go through this logic. You take H. Any of these things have the same invariant. We know that on the diagonal matrices, the invariants are generated by the Newton polynomials. Remember what they were, lambda 1 plus lambda 2, uh, yeah, lambda squared, right? And they generate freely. So this thing evaluated, evaluated in H. Okay. This is true for every H in D. Right? Again, can we think? Okay. 
this is what I'm getting at. But let's let's just let's start with D. Every H in D can be moved, it is diagonalizable. We know that on the diagonal operators, we know what the, what, the, what the invariants are. It's a polynomial in the Newton polynomials. Right? You only need et, those, those end of those things. That's great. Okay? But only, only on diagonalizable operators. Okay? But D is dense. Right? And the invariant is assumed to be con continuous. So it's true for all continuous invariants. Or polynomial. Poly it's assumed to be polynomial. Okay. But B is dense. And by assumption, I was a polynomial invariant. You okay on this? Okay. In that sense, there are only finitely many invariants. This is wonderful. Only finite, you only need fin to compute finitely many things from, a, from an operator to understand the operator in some sense. Namely, these are problems. Okay, this is to me, uh, if somebody asks you what the first fundamental theorem of linear algebra is, to me, this is the first fundamental theorem. You have the endomorphisms. In physics, these will be Hamiltonians. You're interested in properties that are preserved by isomorphism. You are led to try to understand invariance of the group action. <laughs> you have a big set where you can understand it easily, namely the diagonalizable elements. And by continuity, you're finished. Okay. Please think of that. The key issue is the density of the diagonalizable elements. Right? Because on the diagonalizable elements, you can compute. Okay. You, you get what I mean, right? Uh, professor, should I have a mic? No. I have a question. So we restricted ourselves to polynomial invariants. It seems that that was so, so important. I think it's very. In order to go to the continuous invariance, for example, this is a very interesting question. This, this statement is, is true. But of course, uh, uh, what does it mean true? Do uh, you understand what Professor Schub's question is? Uh, instead of looking at polynomial invariance, <laughs> look at continuous functions that are invariant. Okay? Now, you see the answer here is P of N1 through Nn. So, you, for continuous, you can't expect the answer to be P of N1 through N, you just a continuous function of N1 through N. That is also false. You need to read, let me, let me tell you why it is false, but it's almost true. Okay? Don't forget that these things, these things are polynomials of the form N1 squared plus N2, N3, I mean something like this. Yeah? That's a polynomial, and it's kind of complicated, right? But I'm going to give you another one. Okay, so you have to worry about the 
algebra of functions with complex conjugation. And then you have to think what the Weierstrass approximation theorem says. And then, then you have, if you put these two things together, you can, in some obvious way, you will answer your question positively. In this regard. Yeah. And, of course, if you go beyond continuous, you would like to say L2 or something, some other really, it gets very delicate because you see what's happening. I hope you, hope you all understand. This is a beautiful picture here. That if you have, if you have, if you have a Hamiltonian, and you have the orbit of the Hamiltonian here, and this thing is, has different eigenvalues, so the lambda i not equal to lambda j. These orbits are closed in the endomorphism algebra. However, if you have nilpotent elements, the orbits will close up to other orbits. And so you cannot, you cannot separate these two orbits by continuous functions. So you can start trying to separate them by other phenomena that gets very, very delicate. So polynomial easy, continuous functions a little bit more thought. Beyond that, uh, things life gets tough. Question of the Hausdorff nature of the quotient. Okay.